Well, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Institute for Global Leadership's 34th annual Norris and Marjorie Bendenson Epic International Symposium on Migration in a Turbulent World. I'm delighted to welcome our keynote speakers and panelists who have come from far and near to be with us. I'm also pleased to welcome the 66 members of the international student delegations from nine countries, as well as the students from the United States military and naval academies. As this, at this symposium, the Dr. Jean Maillard Global Citizenship Award will be presented to three distinguished individuals who have made outstanding contributions to the scholarship on migration and have served as leading voices in the international community for sensible and just migration policy. Sir Paul Collier, Professor of Economics and Public Policy, Blavatnik School of Government, University of Oxford. The Honorable Ratna Omidvar, Senator for Ontario, <coughs> the Senate of Canada and His Excellency Miroslav Lajcik, Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic. In honoring, them, in honoring them, we hope that their example will inspire current and future students. The mission of the Institute for Global Leadership is to prepare new generations of critical thinkers for effective and ethical leadership who are ready to act as global citizens in addressing the world's most pressing problems. Our mission is more important today than ever. In pursuing our mission, we strive to ensure that the Institute is a place of openness and stimulating exchanges where students of diverse views, cultures, and nations can enlarge their vision with courtesy and civility. The Institute must always breathe the bold, enterprising spirit of youth driven by ideas 
as well as practical idealism. Our foundation program, EPIC, addresses a different theme of fundamental global importance each year. This year's theme, Migration in a Turbulent World, could also not be more timely. Migration is an issue of great complexity, and in many countries, including the United States, a topic of great controversy. Countries are facing a wide array of challenges related to migration, including brain drain and brain gain, human rights, social integration, diversity, xenophobia, human trafficking, and national security. It is also readily apparent that the world is in a state of flux and that we're living in turbulent times. There may not be consensus about the causes of today's turbulence, but to assert its existence provokes little controversy. If we live in an age of turbulence, our response should be founded on the understanding that order is necessary to prevent chaos, and that an order informed by global justice is one most likely to be deemed legitimate and therefore most likely to endure. It is also my duty today to thank those without whom this symposium would not have been possible. We are most grateful for the generosity of the Bendenson family, represented by Bobby and Joanne Bendenson. They'll be here later. I don't think Bobby and Joanne are here. Um, the Institute for Global Leadership benefits from an exceptional external advisory board. We very much appreciate that council and on stinted support, and one of our board members, Jeff Bloom, uh, is here. So thank you very much for the support from the board. We're also grateful for the support of the Provost's Office, and I venture to say, without it, there would be no Institute for Global Leadership, and Diana Shigas is here representing the Provost's Office. I would also like to thank the IGL's alumni who remain passionately committed to the work of the Institute and serve as mentors to current students. I'm delighted that some of our alumni are participating in the symposium. And I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the IGL students uh, who have organized this symposium. Uh, it is a joy to have such a group of intellectually curious, motivated, and diligent students, and they're sitting in the first two rows, we should give them a round of applause. <laughs> and finally, a heartfelt thank you to my IGL colleagues, Heather Barry, is Heather, um, Saida Abdullah, Stacy Kazakova, and Susan Ojuku. They are very... <laughs> They're very dedicated to the Institute and its students. So now it gives me great pleasure to invite Joshua Clarksing, a member of the EPIC class, to introduce our keynote speaker and recipient of the Dr. Jean Mayer Award for Global Citizenship, Sir Paul Collier. Josh. Thank you, Professor Williams, for your wonderful welcome and introduction to this year's EPIC Symposium, Migration in a Turbulent World. My name is Joshua Clarkson, and I am a sophomore member of this year's EPIC Colloquium. It is a great honor to introduce Sir Paul Collier, our keynote speaker. Thanks, Sir Paul, for traveling to be with us today. At the University of Oxford, he is a professor of economics and public policy in the Blavatnik School of Government as well as the director of both the International Growth Center and the Center for the Study of African Economies. A, distingu a distinguished researcher and academic in the field of development economics, Professor Collier has previously served as the director of the Development Research Group of the World Bank. His contributions to promoting research and policy change in Africa earned him a knighthood in 2014 
and election as a fellow of the British Academy in 2017. Of particular note for our symposium is his book, Exodus is Changing Our World, which has served as a textbook for the epic course. This insightful research, which addresses economic, political, and social ramifications of international migration, has been integral to our year-long <coughs> examination of the topic. Given this lifetime of outstanding achievement, I now have the privilege of, pre of presenting Professor Sir Paul Collier with the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award. The award was established in 1993 in honor of Jean Mayer, the 10th president of Tufts University and its first chancellor. Recipients are illustrious scholars and practitioners who exemplify Dr. Mayer's dictum that scholarship, research, and teaching must be dedicated to solving the most pressing problems facing the world. Dr. Mayer's life was dedicated to this principle and Professor Collier's work on migration, economic development, and public policy exemplifies this goal. I will now read the award citation. In recognition of your influential scholarship, which transcends borders and is marked by a passionate concern for the poor and victims of war. Professor Collier, thank you for your outstanding work. Do you want me to take it? Congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, and, um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, let me remind you what EPIC stands for. The, it's Education for Public Inquiry and International Citizenship. And uh, I can't think of anything that I more passionately support than that. Um, why do we need education for public inquiry? Um, because um, we need an informed citizenry. Uh, that's what I've tried to do by writing books that are easy to read. Um, I'll tell you, for future reference, books that are easy to read are hard to write. Right? Um, and most academics don't even try. Right? Um, the, 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 uh, the thank you email that I'm most proud of began, um, I'm 19 years old, have no education, messed up my life, and I'm now working in a care home. Um, but I managed to read two of your books. Right? And it then continued, please could you not use so many big words because dummies like me have to keep looking them up. Right? But I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> um, so um, why do we need an informed citizenry? Because it is the underpinnings for um, pragmatism in public policy. Pragmatism means not make it up as you go along, that's populism. Pragmatism means study the current context, the problems in their current context, and try and work out from evidence and experience what is likely to work best in the present context, right? It is very firmly an American tradition, the philosophers Peirce and James. Uh, it's a wonderful tradition. And it, is the, uh, it immunizes you, the society, if you've got that informed citizenry, it immunizes you from the two menaces. One is that policy is set by ideologues who think that there is just one book or idea that guides you to utopia regardless of the problems. Right? All ideologies are false. Right? They're delusions. There is no utopia. There is no guidebook. Problems are always changing and need to be understood in context. And the other enemy, apart from ideology, is populism. Right? I can't think of an example of that at the moment. Um, <laughs> so that's why we need an informed citizenry. And why do we need citizenship and international citizenship? Because together, we are capable of effortful purposes that we are incapable of individually. We need citizenry, we need government. Uh, and we need people, everybody, to be morally load-bearing. And I'll come back to that. 
Um, so, um, it's a change to be talking about migration and refugees. I, I did two books on them, Exodus and Refuge. Refuge together with my colleague Alex Betts, who's director of the Refugee Studies Center at Oxford. But I've just come out with a, a new book, The Future of Capitalism, and I've been talking about that incessantly for the last three months. And so it's lovely to get out of doing that. Um, so we're going to be talking migration. Um, migration is a completely normal phenomenon. Um, many people have some sort of migrant history. You know, my grandfather migrated from Germany. My wife migrated from Italy, but is actually Dutch. And my son was born in America, but you know, we live in Britain. Um, and that's not so unusual. Um, so it's pretty normal migration. Um, uh, it ought to be a pretty minor thing, but it's actually been politicized before it's been analyzed. And it, that, that has turned into an explosive cocktail in which the society has polarized into two ludicrous um, and theatrical extremes. On the one hand, you've got a group, a, one group of racists, another group of people who are not racist, they're just fearful. And on the other side, you've got some rather loathsome sort of moral posturing people who want to say, I, aren't I good? Um, and then another group of people who are sort of headless hearts. Um, and, uh, and neither of those sides has, is, is of any use. Um, migration is a complex problem and needs to be understood in its full complexity. Um, and so it's got to be analyzed. And this sort of theatrical polarization um, has crowded out analysis. In the process, it's made migration the number one policy topic under discussion, uh, which is crazy. I mean, migration should be an utterly minor bit of public policy. Um, it should be comp really quite peripheral. There are, there are very big things that public policy needs to be worrying about. Um, uh, and yet, it is the top issue. It's led in Europe to the complete collapse of the social democratic center. Um, and above all, it's led to the massive loss of, loss of trust in government. And the loss of trust in government is a huge price to pay for anything. Because trust in government is a vital ingredient of willing compliance with government. And no government can function at the level that is required in advanced Western society unless it's got willing compliance of a large majority of citizens. So we need to get back to, 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 to willing compliance. Um, that's all a prelude for saying that migration policies have manifestly been unsustainable. Um, and they need to become sustainable. So what does it mean to have sustainable migration policies? And I'm going to suggest there are, there are really just two big criteria for what we mean by sustainable migration policies. Um, uh, Incidentally, it means that the policies are sustainable. Right? That the policies are not constantly being pushed and derailed. Um, and it, it, I'm going to say it, 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 it's got to be democratic and it's got to be ethical. Um, and let me say a few words about what it means for migration policy to be democratic, and then more about what it means to be ethical. Um, so to say that migration policies and, and also refugee policies need to be set democratically, um, they're going to be set democratically. Voters in the OECD, because they've lost trust with governments on this issue, voters are going to be setting migration policy, not um, not, 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 not elites, not governing elites. Um, 
And, um, and if you think about it for a moment, that must be right. I mean, policies in a democracy must be set by, by a democratic process. Um, it's completely unsustainable to have policies that a majority of people regard as wrong. Right? Um, but that's just in the OECD countries. Um, for refugees, by far the most important uh, countries in concern, concerned with providing haven for refugees are not the OECD, although we make a lot of fuss about it. 85% uh, of refugees are in poor countries, not in rich ones. And so what matters is what the governments of poor countries do, whether, they are, whether they continue to be willing to provide haven. Uh, that's vital. And that is now set democratically. Didn't used to be. Poor countries used to be subject to what I call moral imperialism. That is, they were being bullied and forced into doing whatever we thought they should do. That game is over, really. My own country, Britain, doesn't realize it. Um, you know, old imperial instincts die awful hard, so. Um, and in 2017, I was invited by the German government to, uh, to advise them on Africa Initiative. They were the president of the G20. So, um, so I had dinner with Chancellor Merkel and all the, the economic cabinet. I said, there are three principles you've got to stick to in, uh, in, in any policy towards Africa nowadays. Um, and I could see Chancellor Merkel take out her pen and write it down. Number one, don't preach. Didn't like that. She's, she's the daughter of a preacher. She wanted to go and tell Africans what they ought to be doing, right? Africans are really fed up with that. I can tell you know. So don't preach. Don't threaten. Don't say, unless you do what we want, we're going to force you. Right? And don't bribe, by which I mean, don't say, you can't have our money. You know, we'll give you money if you do what we want. All off the agenda, right? The, the, the policies of the governments of poor countries are now going to be set by the people living in those poor countries, not by us. Right? And um, despite the British government at one stage having made me the com a commander of the British Empire, I am really very delighted that the empire is op over and that this imperialism is over, including its last vestige. Right? Um, so, um, it's got to be democratic, it's going to be democratic. And we should be celebrating that, not bemoaning it. And now I turn to it's got to be ethical. Um, and I'll come to that, but it's got to be the ethics of, of the majority of people. That's what we mean by it being democratic. Right? Um, uh, so, um, what... Um, uh, obligations, what ethics uh, do, does the majority of the population have? Um, and um, uh, everybody is naturally morally load bearing. Everybody, both individually and in the organizations that we put together in order to be more effective than just individuals. And there are there are three layers of organizations that we put together to make us, to empower us. Um, one is we put together things called families, which is the only organization ever discovered for successfully rearing children. Um, the other is firms, which are the only organization ever discovered for making the mass of the population productive. And the third one, of course, a residual one, is government. And we need all three. Right? Um, and because the individuals are morally load-bearing, so those organizations, firms, families, and government, can be morally load-bearing. And somehow, um, we got captured by an ideology which denied that. Um, a lot of this is due to my own subject, economics, um, which embraced a, a, a concept of economic man plus a philosophy of utilitarianism. And this is a disastrous cocktail. 
right? So economic man is greedy, selfish, and lazy, right? um, and so incapable of moral load-bearing. Right? Um, fortunately, there is very good uh, evidence that economic man um, died out as a result of evolution because he was so selfish that he got thrown out of groups. And if you weren't in a group, you were dead. Right? So evolution, which economists think, think produced the selfish person, actually eliminated uh, the selfish person. Um, we all want to belong to groups, and we want the esteem of the group. And that makes us capable of bearing obligations to a group. Um, the, uh, that's what the Future of Capitalism book is about. Um, uh, the, um, and as such, as morally load-bearing people, we need to be in a, capable of contributing to society. We are not, as implied by economic man, merely interested in our own consumption. We are contributors. We are designed to be purposeful contributors, not just sitting there lazily consuming as economic man does. You can distort people into being economic man, but it is a, you know, it is a shameful distortion. So, if everybody is morally load-bearing, what moral loads do we bear? Well, there are two big classes of obligation. One uh, is the obligations which are reciprocal. Right? I'll have obligations to you as, you as long as you have obligations to me. Right? And the difference between unsuccessful societies and successful societies, and it's a huge difference, is the extent to which the society has been able to build these reciprocal obligations. They have to be put in place. Um, and you know, the, the most successful societies on Earth, which are actually not America, they're Scandinavia, have over the, the last century put in place a set of reciprocal obligations such as humanity has never seen before in 15,000 years of civilization. And they're fantastic places to live. Um, so that's the reciprocal obligations. Um, and there's a dense web of them in a good society. Um, but the, there's another class of obligation which are not reciprocal at all, and they're duties of rescue. Um, and they're particularly important um, in respect of migration. So there are two really important duties of rescue. Um, one uh, is to the global poor. That's what I've been working on most of my life. That was why I wrote The Bottom Billion, to try and get people a greater awareness of our non-reciprocal obligations to people in societies which are not, at the moment, providing credible hope of catching up to their citizens. Right? And so what is the duty, our duty towards those societies? It is not to look at them as economic man and say, all you are is consumers, so we will transfer consumption to you. Right? They know more than we are just consumers. Right? They are active, they are actors, not passive consumers, they are active producers. And the tragedy in those societies is that despite working hard, people in these societies are desperately unproductive. There's a very simple reason why they're desperately unproductive, and that is they're working solo. You know, Two-thirds of Africa's human capital is working in isolation on its own. Scale, zero, specialization, zero, productivity doomed. Right? What Africa needs is what we built, which is those organizations that make people productive, namely firms. Right? And Africa is desperately short of proper firms, firms that will be able to organize people so that they've got scale and specialization, to reap the economies of scale and the economies of specialization. Right? 
We've got those organizations. We've got firms in abundance. And the genius of a firm is it can replicate itself. You know, one firm, one foreign firm went to Bangladesh in about 1980 and set up a garments factory. And at the end of the year, most of its employees left because they said, God, this firm doesn't know how to operate in Bangladesh, but we do. And we've learned how to do garments now, so we'll set up our own firms to do garments. And so now Bangladesh has a huge garments industry. Nearly all Bangladeshi firms, it exports $30 billion of exports a year. Huge. It's transformed the um, position of women in Bangladeshi society because it's provided a job opportunity for young women, which has very considerably reduced, improved their bargaining power within the family. So that's the sort of thing that uh, poor countries really need from us. Um, and that's the sort of thing that, in my day job, that's what I do. You know, I, I work with the Germans on a thing called Compact with Africa, which is trying to get European firms to go to the sort of more successful end of African societies. And then uh, last month, I convened um, 27 of the, development, the world's development finance institutions, um, things like IFC, the private sector arm of the World Bank, OPIC in America, um, and it was the first time those 27 had ever been convened for the specific purpose of trying to scale up their operations in fragile states, which is the sort of bottom end of the spectrum. You need different strategies for the countries which are at the top end of the spectrum and the bottom end of the spectrum. And at last, we've, we've got them. So that's the sort of thing we can do. We can do an awful lot of good in some desperately poor places. That's our duty of rescue towards enabling these people to catch up. Right? It's the dignity of being able to make them productive. Um, and then I come to refugees, where there's another very clear duty of rescue. Um, and, and what is that duty of rescue? Um, it is, it, now, here it's important to, rec to realize that refugees are not natural migrants. They're not people who choose to leave their country. Refugees, by definition, are people who choose to stay in their country, and then it becomes unlivable. Right? Refugees are a subset of the displaced. And the displaced, by definition, are people who wanted to stay. Right? And about half, a little bit more than half of the displaced find some haven elsewhere in the country or can't get out of the country and the other half get across a border and are legally refugees. Right? But the, 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 the distinction between the internally displaced and, the, and, the, and refugees is a, is, a, is, a, is a minor one, really. The big concept is, did you wake up in the morning thinking, I want to live in California, or did you wake up in the morning thinking, this place is too dangerous to stay? Where can I find somewhere that's safe? Uh, so what is our duty towards people who are displaced? And it's really to reestablish, first of all, it's, it's a duty of care. That's fairly obvious. They need somewhere to, to live. They need some food. Um, that's a very temporary fix. Um, uh, most of all, um, refugees need to reestablish autonomy and try and hold their community together. Those are the big, right? If we want to think in terms of human dignity rather than this economic man, all they are is a bunch of consumers, right? dignity means re-establishing autonomy. And re-establishing autonomy basically comes back to, are you able to earn a living as a refugee? Right? And we've been amazingly negligent in caring about that. So, you know, UNHCR's business model until very recently paid no attention to that. It was camps, food, free food, free accommodation. You know, it was back to economic man, you're just consumers. Right? We'll, we'll feed and, 
and housing. As a result of which, about 90% of the refugees in the world ignore the whole UNHCR system. They don't go to camps, they go to towns. Why do they go to towns and cities? Because they can get under the radar screen and work illegally. And if you work illegally, you're at the bottom of the pile, but at least you re-establish autonomy. At least you can feed your family because you're earning it yourself. You know? So, the challenge to do a better job with refugees is not build bigger camps. It's to get people jobs. You know? And modern globalization, just as modern globalization, is perfectly capable of taking productive jobs to the poorest places in the world, it's perfectly capable of taking jobs to refugees. You know? That's what Alex Betts and I started in uh, Jordan um, in 2015. We were brought in by the government of Jordan to say, what on earth are we going to do? A million refugees, four years here, completely neglected by the international community, which is actually cutting the budget of support. Europe's got bored with, the refugee, with Syrian refugees. Right? What on earth are we, the government of Jordan, to do? Right? And so we came up with a very, this very simple approach. It was, it was completely fortuitous. We were driven to see the biggest refugee camp, which had about 90,000 refugees in it. Governor Jordan, our officials, the officials who took us there were kind of, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a big camp, isn't it? You know? Would you like to see something interesting whilst you're here? Huh? So they drove us 10 minutes to see the King Abdullah Industrial Park, which they'd spent $100 million on, and was 10 minutes away, and had been empty for four years. 90% empty. Huh? Why? Because no Jordanians wanted to work there. Because it was near a conflict zone. Huh? So there you had two Oxford professors with a refugee camp with 90,000 people who couldn't work, and just 10 minutes away, a big industrial park fully equipped with electricity and infrastructure and so on, but no people wanted to work in it. Right? And because we are two Oxford professors, eventually we thought of an idea. Weren't we clever? Right? The amazing thing is that for four years, nobody had thought of it. Right? You've thought of it in four, four minutes. Right? So that was the compact with Jordan. And the compact with Jordan has now become an international model which is picked up by Ethiopia, by Malaysia. It's, it's now become sort of a new global model. Um, so that's our duty of refuge for refugees, duty of rescue for refugees, first and foremost. Um, where um, does this leave? Um, so the, the basic concept is, is of humane globalization, where you don't inhumane globalization is, say, basically, swim to a job. Right? Move the people to the jobs. And humane globalization is move productivity to people where they belong. Um, so where does migration fit in all this? Um, it's not a, in our view, I speak for Alex Betts and myself here. It's not in our view a global right. There's no either legal or moral right to migrate, we think. But it, of course, it's a perfectly sensible phenomenon as long as it leads to mutual benefit. It's a transaction. And, um, and mutual benefit means benefit for host societies, benefit for migrants, which is usually but not necessarily automatic, um, and benefit for... Um, for the countries of origin. Um, and so just let me close with a few remarks on, on that. Um, for hosts, um, most of the literature has fussed around short-term economic effects of migration on host societies. And um, that has been bedeviled by advocacy on both sides. But um, the, the, the best work here is, I think, is by uh, Frederick Dockier and his team in Belgium. And the, their conclusion is that as far as wages are concerned, 
um, the best estimates of effects on host populations is zero. Give or minus half a percent. So in other words, the, the effect on labor market is tiny. Um, then there's an effect on assets, which varies a lot uh, by society. Um, so if I give you a, sort of an extreme example of a, of a negative effect on assets, you can also think of examples of positive effects, but an extreme example of negative effects is, um, would, be, would be people moving to Norway. So for the next three weeks, nearly, no, exactly the next three weeks, whilst Britain is still a member of the European Union, um, I have a right to go and live in Norway with my family. And you know, as, as things are looking at the moment, that's why I've got to fly back to Britain, because I've got to, I've got to get to Norway, right? Um, and uh, Norway and Britain each had half the North Sea oil. And the only difference between us was um, we spent ours and they saved theirs. Right? So that, now we've got a heap of debt and they've got a huge national sovereign wealth fund. It's worth $200,000 for every, uh, every Norwegian. Right? So if I and my wife and three kids move to Norway, um, we're a million dollars better off and Norwegians are a million dollars worse off. Right? Um, that's great for, for me. I can't really, in my heart of hearts, think it is my ethical right. right? It isn't, really, if you think about it. Um, the, um, uh, but, uh, but the more important effects of, of migration on host countries are not really the economic effects. Um, they, and they depend, they're very different in different societies, depending upon what the social model is. And um, I'll contrast three social models. One is the, the Nordic social model, which is of um, uh, solidarity around building up a welfare system. Right? This is the reciprocal obligations that build huge public benefits. Um, and there, um, obviously, somebody entering that system suddenly is bequeathed on them a massive amount of public benefits that are built up as a result of years of these reciprocal obligations. So, understandably, in a, in a, a welfare solidarity system, um, people will be very wary of, migra of migration, for good reason, I think. Then, in a liberal society, which is really what the UK's got, Britain, my, my own country, um, there's very little chatter about um, the uh, loss of, uh, of welfare benefits because welfare benefits are much smaller. Um, and in Britain, all the concern, the anxieties, are around jobs. Um, will immigrants crowd out? crowd us out from jobs. Um, and um, Britain's got pretty close to full employment, so it's not crowding. It's, it's, it's what jobs get people get crowded out of, really. Um, and then the third model, which is neither solidarist, solidarity nor liberal, um, but libertarian, which is, which is America, um, there, um, it's, 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 it's not really jobs, and it's not really, it's certainly not welfare. Um, it seems, the concern seems to be more about security. So you've got very different debates, depending on what the social model is, I think. Um, I'll draw to a close, but um, let me talk a little bit about the left behind. Um, the, the poor countries, which are the countries of, countries of origin for migration. And, um, and there, we, in the advanced countries, have an ethical tension because it's in our interest to have skilled people come from poor countries to us. We benefit from that. Um, but the people left behind in poor countries don't. Right? Again, there's a very good recent estimate by Dockier and his team, which is that 
quite big gains to OECD countries from skilled immigration um, and quite big GDP losses um, uh, for, for, to, to poor countries. Um, just to give you practical examples, um, I've got a Sudanese doctor for a student at the moment, and he tells me he's, there are more Sudanese doctors in London than in the whole of the Sudan. Um, now, in terms of global GDP, that is an improvement. It's efficient. Right? It's even efficient if the doctor leaves Sudan and becomes a taxi driver in London. Income goes up. Right? So, say that's great. Right? Um, uh, but clearly, in any more meaningful ethical framework, um, it's shameful that Britain doesn't train its own doctors but draws them from Sudan. Britain has three of the top ten universities in the world, right? It's perfectly capable of training enough doctors. It's just cheaper to let Sudan train them and then poach them. So it's, it's really a deeply unethical strategy. Um, and um, even within Europe, I, I live part of the year in a very poor area of rural France. Small town. It's absolutely lovely. But uh, our doctor's just retired and no French doctor wants to uh, go that far from Paris to, uh, to, to small town French life. Um, but we don't have to worry because um, uh, what we're filling up with is Romanian doctors. Because Romanian doctors can earn far more in small town France than in small town Romania. So Romania has lost about a third of its doctors, all from small towns, um, to, 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 to France, which of course would be perfectly capable of paying doctors a premium and getting them to go and live in hell on earth places like where I live for a third of the year because it's so lovely. Um, so what do we celebrate? Do, do we celebrate the freedom of Romanian doctors to fulfill themselves? Right? Or do we worry about a family in small town Romania with a sick kid? You know? Where's the ethics here? You know? It's certainly not clear that we should just take the libertarian view and say this is fulfillment of individual dreams. You know? um, and finally, on the left behind, um, a couple of days ago in the Financial Times, there was a, 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 a feature on Nigeria, and there was a, the, the chief executive of, a, of a quite a big Nigerian firm. And he said, our enemy um, is the Canadian points system. <laughs> uh, because, um, because we can't compete with life in Canada, and it's just draining us of, of these skilled young people. Um, now Nigeria is, of course, a, you know, an, a mega tragedy. Yeah. Um, but it certainly needs to catch up. There is no future scenario of the Earth other than Nigeria catching up, which is in any way globally acceptable. Um, so we're subject to, you know, to some sort of moral injunction, thou shalt not tempt, I think. Uh, and finally, let me turn to controls. Um, um, we will, of course, need uh, some controls in immigration. Um, by far the best way of doing it is controls not at the border, but behind the border. The rights to... Uh, the rights to get a job, the rights to get um, uh, social benefits, and so on. Um, within Europe, um, we've got porous external borders, as everybody knows, um, uh, and some societies have very effective internal behind, behind the border controls, and others don't. It's generally the northern European countries, which have very effective internal control systems. So, for example, Scandinavia has no, to first approximation, it has no irregular immigrants. Because if you're an irregular immigrant there, you wouldn't be able to get a job, you wouldn't be able to get benefits. There's no point in being there. 
So all the irregular immigrants go to the countries in Europe that have um, incompetent um, uh, regulation of the labor market, incompetent regulation of, of benefits, um, most particularly Italy. Yeah? Um, and so the, you know, the, 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 there is no future scenario, I think, other than building effective um, uh, labor market regulations and, uh, and effective uh, uh, welfare regulations. Um, the, um, how do we do that? Well, in order to, for example, in order to have effective labor market regulations, you have to start from a position where pretty well all employers obey them. And you can't do that if you start from a position where employers are routinely employing a whole load of people illegally. Because then you can, never, you can never enforce something which thousands and thousands of firms are, 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 break, are, are not enforcing. Right? So if we apply this to a purely hypothetical context of America, were America to have 11 million irregular immigrants, the only way it would be able to uh, get effective behind the border controls would be if it legalized them. You have to legalize the stock in order to control the flow. That's sort of elementary. Right? You can't effectively control things at the border, as Europe's basically found out, but you can effectively control things behind the border. Um, so to do that, you have to legalize whatever stock of irregular immigrants you've got. Um, so just for my own amusement, I tried to think up of the worst public policy combination you could possibly imagine, right? And it would be that you said, we will not legalize the stock of irregular migrants in the country, supposing you had a big stock, but what we will do is we will build a wall. <laughs> because the, the genius of building a wall is that the people, that irregular stock, who are now inside the wall, daren't ever leave. Because if they leave, they can't get back. Right? So that would be the ultimate incoherent public policy on migration, and we're fortunate that nobody's doing it. <laughs> um, uh, but I'd have thought of a very good slogan um, which should anybody try that combination, um, uh, he should use. Um, because actually, uh, in recent years, the flow of, if we take America as a hypothetical example, the flow of Mexicans out of America to Mexico has been bigger than the flow from Mexico into America. Right? Um, so if you wanted to stop that, you would build a wall with the slogan, keep them in. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you for that uh, wonderful keynote, Professor Collier. And before we get the Q&A session underway, I would just like to recognize Anthony Monaco, president of Tufts University. Uh, so thank you for being with us today. Uh, and so I'm just going to set some of the ground rules for the Q&A session. So there are two mics, uh, one in each aisle. Uh, and so anyone with a question can get in line and then we're going to alternate between sides. Uh, and please try to keep your questions brief as we have to be out of this room promptly at 5.15 and we wanna get uh, as many questions as possible. So please keep your question to under a minute. And so with that, anyone with a question? please feel free to get in line. Um, yes. Uh, Sir Collier, um, in your most recent book. I never use the title. Right. <laughs> Apologies. Um, Mr. Collier, in uh, your most recent book, The Future of Capitalism, you denounce utilitarianism. Um, However, in Exodus, uh, 
your approach acknowledges that migrations, while they suffer psychological effects from uh, psychological downsides from migrating, that they are overwhelmingly reap economic benefits from migration. So if you're advocating for controlled migration at any level, isn't that in some way more utilitarian um, because uh, you are, uh, yeah. No, no, I'm trying to, so the, it's a good question because it's forced me to, to make something clear that because there's no sort of global right to migrate, um, um, migration is a good thing, but it should be, it, it's good as long as there are mutual benefits, right? But the mutual benefits have to be benefits to the host society and benefits to the uh, leaving society, to the, the country of origin. And so um, it's not enough to say the migrant benefits, so it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, there's a moral obligation that we can only say that's fine as long as um, the, the, the host society and the country of origin both, uh, both benefit, right? So it's a, um, now, obviously, if I was a libertarian and said, I don't care about anything other than the freedom of the individual to do whatever they damn well want, right? So I'm, as you'll have gathered, I'm certainly not a libertarian, right? I'm much more a communitarian. I, my ethics is uh, sort of Alistair McIntyre's after virtue ethics, really, which is why I'm not a utilitarian either. But, um, but, but, but the basic principle is migration is good as long as it satisfies the condition that the host society doesn't lose and the people in the, back in the country of origin don't lose. Right? Thank you. I also forgot to mention, please introduce yourself before asking your question. Um, greetings, Professor Collier. I'm from Peking University, <coughs> China. Uh, my name is Du Jiang in Chinese. Uh, so I was originally going to ask whether you think nationalism is going to be an important barrier for fulfilling what you call the legal obligations, because essentially nationalism is a thinking that says uh, the, the um, interests of your country is the utmost priority. But since you have also answered that you believe migration is only uh, acceptable when it is beneficial to both the origin country and the destination country, uh, then we'd like to ask, since basically uh, you're promoting these double win schemes, then why haven't the governments all over the world noticed these uh, double win schemes? Because from what I get the feeling is that migration is still treated as a major problem instead of these win-win deals. So I just don't know what is preventing them from realizing and making this point happen. Yeah, now it's a very good, it's a very good question. And let me try a very good answer. So the, the point of sustainable migration as a concept is that it gives us language to discuss just that. That there are plenty of contexts in which Migration benefits both the host country, the country of origin, and the migrant. Um, when you're looking at migration from poor countries to rich ones, by far the system which is maximally beneficial is actually circular migration, temporary migration. Or it's migration, the sort of stuff that, where you've got young people coming from very poor countries, getting a good education, in rich countries, maybe getting some job experience and then going back. That is phenomenally beneficial in all sorts of respects, right? So uh, that is the win, 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 right? Mm -hmm. That's the mutual benefit. But we've not actually had a language on migration which seeks mutual benefit. That, that is, you know, it's only mutual benefit that gives you sustainable policies. If one big block of people lose, it's not sustainable. Especially, and if, if the block that loses is the countries of origin, it's really not ethical, right? Um, so um, sustainable migration policies, sustainable policies are policies which um, have a language around them, and the language around them is this language of mutual benefit. And as we moved from um, 
these, this language of, you know, sort of the rights of migrants to the language of mutual benefit, we'd start to get much more of this thing being possible, I think. Okay, thank you so much. Good evening, my name is Connor. I'm a sophomore in the EPIC class. And I was wondering, how does a hypothetical country such as the United States grapple with a mass legalization program when its economy and certain sectors of its economy are so dependent on uh, rather lax and loose uh, labor regulations and under the table sort of uh, pushing that when um, migrants necessarily aren't legal? Yeah. Um, same with my own country. Um, uh, the answer is um, that um, a, an economy as productive as America, if it was properly organized, that productivity, it would be able to make everybody reasonably productive. Right? You don't need in a society uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a society with a lot of modern technology, you don't need a very low-wage class of people. You only need a very low-wage class of people if your education and training system is hopeless, so that people are not, so that a bunch of people are not equipped to be even minimally productive. Right? Now, in both your country and my country at the moment, um, we have this paradox that both of us have the best universities on earth and utterly fail to train um, the less cognitively gifted third of the population. Right? And that is a staggering um, mismatch uh, of, of investments uh, in, in equipping young people with being productive. Right? If you're cognitively very bright, as all you lot are, right? You're in the best place on earth. If you're cognitively not so bright, you're in a very poor place. You'd be very much better off in Switzerland or Finland or Germany where all this training of the non-cognitively gifted is taken seriously. You know? Germany has full more full employment than you have. Huh? You've got quite a lot of unemployment. It's all disguised because people are not in the labor, labor force. But Germany's got, and Switzerland. You know, in Switzerland, you can count the unemployed on two hands, basically. Um, but the minimum wage that people are getting in Switzerland is very high. Right? So the answer is you train. You invest in training. Right? Thank you. Um, hello, Professor Collier. Um, thank you so much for your speech. Um, I'm Arjun Padalkar, and I'm part of the Epic Colloquium. Um, my question pertains to your book where you mention um, that it would be more effective to move the social models from the host countries to the country of origin um, rather than allowing the movement of people to, those to the host countries. Um, I just want to know how such a transition would work and wouldn't the problems of moving such social models to um, a country of origin where there are different governments, different um, religions, different kinds of people that live, how would such a transition work? Yeah, so uh, again, it's a, good, it's a good question. And um, let me explain what I mean here. It's that um, it's not that every society has got to look like America, right? really. Um, um, nor has every society got to look like Scandinavia. Um, but, um, but there are some things which do need to transfer. The, the, this whole notion of building reciprocal obligations. Right? Um, what they look like differs according to each society. Each society, its whole history and culture are different. Um, but it's the, the basic process of building reciprocal obligations is, is kind of the, the same animal. Um, and it's striking that some societies have managed to build huge pyramids of reciprocal obligations, and others um, hardly any. Right? Um, now, how do you transfer those ideas? Well, certainly not by moral imperialism, right? not by saying, you should do this. Right? Um, the way that ideas transfer is, um, is, two, is two ways. One is um, by people getting into social networks where these ideas are normal, which is one of the benefits of migration. 
we know, for example, that when um, people get people from poor countries get education in rich ones and then go back to their home countries, those the more of such people there are, um, the more the the um, country of origin um, more rapidly it becomes democratic. Yeah. So that, that's one transfer of, 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 of ideas through being immersed in social networks. The other way of transfer is imitation. And so, um, for example, in Africa, um, if you get, as we're now starting to get, four or five African countries which really start to get ahead, start to build cooperative societies <coughs> instead of internal violent oppositional identities, but some shared identity which enables cooperation and this building of reciprocal obligations. And that's starting to happen in about four or five African countries now. Um, as those countries get ahead, the same process in Africa will happen as happened in Asia which is, you know, four countries got ahead, and then wham, China decided it could do that too. And then India decided it could do it too. And, you know, the, what followed was the biggest reduction in global poverty we've ever seen, you know. So it's, it's partly immersion in networks, which is the big contribution of migration, the, ex, the flow of ideas, because people come, get in those networks, see what works and partly then the, the force of imitation. Thank you so much. We have time for two more questions, so these will be the final two. Hi, my name is Mari, and I'm from the University of Ottawa. And my question was about, when you talk about the need to create benefits for host countries, what do we do when the perception of what benefits are are not necessarily rational? For example, when the discourse is marred with xenophobia, or racism, and I'm thinking even in Scandinavian countries, which may have some of the strongest reciprocal obligations, there are strong issues of xenophobia and racism in those countries about who can and should enter. Yeah, I think um, um, the, there'll always be a, you know, in all societies, you've got an element of xenophobia and racism, right? Um, it's, um, I think the larger category that we have to worry about is the group that are fearful. Um, uh, I don't remember, Britain, you got a majority voting for Brexit. Um, we certainly don't have a, a majority of the population that is racist. I mean, it's just, just that's completely untrue. Britain's been extraordinarily. Um, open in terms of, 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 of racial, much, much, much more so than America, partly because it doesn't have this history of slavery. You know. um, uh, but still, half the population voted for Brexit. And we, we, so it wasn't racism, it was, uh, but it was fear. Um, the people who voted against uh, were people um, in uh, provincial towns and cities that were going down, whereas London was going up and people with less education and manual skills that were getting less valuable, and the London skilled was celebrating their, their, their productivity. So it was a, it was a mutiny. Um, I think in the many respects, the Trump phenomenon was the same. It was a mutiny against uh, prolonged neglect. And so the, 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 the real answer to your question is that um, societies pay a heavy price for allowing these spatial and class divergences to open up. And in both Britain and America, um, we've allowed that those divergences between the metropolitan skilled and the provincial less skilled to get wider and wider for 40 years. And it's not surprising that you then get mutinies. It's also not surprising that then you get scapegoats. And so in both cases, you see, in Britain, it's not the immigrants that are the scapegoats, it's the Brussels, right? Thank America you. doesn't have a Brussels to blame, so it blames immigrants, you know? But uh, if, you, if you join the European Union, you could blame Brussels like everybody else. Thank you. 
Hi, Professor Collier. My name is Uzair. I'm of course, I'm just to finish. You blame the UN, I believe, right? <laughs> Um, my name is Uzair. I'm a part of the Epic Colloquium, and I had the pleasure of reading your book um, over the course of the semester, like everyone else. Um, I just had a few um, clarifications on things you've written in the book. And so you talked about how you wanted the book to be easy to read, and that was illustrated through sort of your narrative-based um, research and, and the way you've written the book. Um, and that definitely comes through. But in, in cases where um, I personally felt like your narrative overly simplified and um, reductified like the situation of migration. And I felt that that may just add more fuel to the fire as to generalizing communities and nations. And um, whilst this has happened a lot in the book, one striking example was how you described um, the Nigerian community that would immigrate to the UK as having low levels of trust in, in Nigerian society. And you base that on the history of the slave trade in Nigeria, as well as your own visits to Nigeria, where you'd see um, stamps in hotel rooms that would, that would say, um, please don't, you know, the room will be checked before you check out, so please don't take anything else. Um, or the fact that people, like there's some people in Nigeria who could just purchase um, death certificates for inheritance and God knows what. Whilst those situations aren't specific to Nigeria, you've very specifically targeted those on the Nigerian community coming to the UK to illustrate the example of um, mutual trust as to how low trusting societies, if migrating to high trusting societies, could create a lack of social cohesion. My question is, do you think forwarding a narrative like this, which is inherently reductive and simplistic in nature, would simply add more fuel to the fire as to describing very complex phenomenon of migration that you've talked about today? Um. The, look, I think the, first of all, there are very big differences in the degree to which people trust each other in different societies. And that's measured quite widely now. Um, and it's, it is quite clear that uh, you know, Nigeria is at very much at a low trust end of the spectrum. People don't trust government, but they don't trust each other. Um, and uh, um, so that's a, that is a, a social fact as much as, you know, much as it's, it's a social fact in much the same way that we know that we make a lot of other statements in social science, right? Um, the, now, I, if you're telling me that um, we shouldn't reveal some social facts because they might disturb, you know, they might play the wrong way. Um, uh, I thought about that, obviously, for a long time. Um, um, but I think it's, um, it's in the end, um, we have a duty as academics to honesty. And um, uh, the, it, why the mass of the population have lost trust both with governments and with elites, is that they believe they've been lied to. And um, uh, it hit me very strikingly about seven or so years ago when I was at the British Treasury. Um, and I was asked to give a lecture on migration. And it was sort of and at the end, uh, an official from the Treasury came up to me and said, um, you know, it was very, very helpful, but in your public utterances, would you mind just saying that migration is really good? Um, and then he said, of course, it doesn't have to be true. Now, um, I was a bit shocked by that because that cannot be uh, a, either an ethical or a sensible position. Right? Um, uh, so I think it's, it's, it is more important to present the truth as you see it. The, the anecdotes are there to, they're just anecdotes. They're there to try and illustrate to people what it means. They're not evidence. Right? But the evidence is, 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 is quite a different matter. Right? Um, so the answer is, 
I agonized over this, but I've, I've come to the view that qua academic, we have a, a absolute ethical responsibility to, um, to explain the truth as best we see it in a, in a you know, in a, um, in a, in a style that is not provocative, and I hope, I don't know, I, mean, I try to be absolutely balanced in the book. I was very proud of the Robert Putnam um, endorsement. It's not as if I know Robert Putnam, but you know, he's, he's about as good as it gets in terms of um, uh, intellectual standards, I think. So that was my, that's my justification. Thank you. All right, so thank you again to Professor Collier for coming and speaking with us today. Uh, and then this is just a reminder that we have to get out of this room fairly quickly, uh, as it is now a bit after 5.15. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you.